afternoon, everyone. I appreciate that you'll all settle in, sit down. It is my distinguished honor to welcome you all to this event. It is truly only such an important topic that will bring us all together. Your attention and your respect are appreciated. At this time, I would like to welcome Katie Van Haest from Senator Sanders' office to share with us some information about this afternoon's event. Welcome, Katie. Thanks so much, Tracy. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Katie Van Haest. I work in Senator Sanders' office here in Burlington. Just a couple quick housekeeping items for all of you. You may have seen, gotten index cards when you came in. If you have questions for the senator or the panel that you don't want to ask aloud, you can write your question on that index card, pass it to the ends, and folks on our staff will then collect those index cards and pass them up to me for questions. When we get to Q&A, we're going to have one mic in the middle and then two mics kind of roaming around with folks on our staff. So if you have a question, either line up or raise your hand, especially if you're on the sides, and we'll get to you. When the panel finishes speaking and we move into question and answer, any member of the media at that point, we will go off the record. So cameras off, pens down, and we'll go off the record at that point. So your question and answers for the senator and for the panel will be completely off the record. Um, I just want to thank some folks that we have here joining us in the room today. Community Health Centers of Burlington, Turning Point of Chittenden County, Spectrum Youth Services, and Lund. They all have tables in the back and they've got a bunch of great information for you. Uh, Senator Sanders' office also has a table in the back that has a bunch of information in it on how our office can help you, um, as well as if you want to send a message to the senator, have a problem we can help you with, or a bunch of information on some upcoming youth services and events that our office is doing. So with that, I want to introduce Senator Sanders to speak to all of you. Well. Let me begin by thanking uh, Principal Tracy uh, Razico and her staff for all of their help in making this event possible today. And it's nice to be back at BHS where a few years ago, four of my kids graduated. So it's good to be here. And I also want to thank uh, Tara uh, Rukert from the Burlington Partnership for a Healthy Community and the Above the Influence BHS student group for your ideas as to what we should be doing today. And let me also thank Attorney General T.J. Donovan, Dr. Heather Stein, and Kelly Breyer for being here as well. And you're going to hear from all of them in a few moments. And uh, mostly, I want to thank each and every one of you for being here today. Now the reason that I am here, and the reason that all of us are here, is that I am worried. Your parents and your grandchildren are worried. The governor and the state legislature are worried, and many of you are worried about an epidemic, an epidemic that is sweeping our country and sweeping the state of Vermont. And that, of course, is the very significant increase that we are seeing in opioid and heroin addiction and in fatal drug overdoses. Now, I know that it is hard for kids your age to listen to an older generation. Believe it or not, we were once your age. And believe it or not, when older people came before, we were saying, why do we have to sit here? We got other things that we would like to do with our lives. And, um, you know, what's this all about? And we know that you, as well as every other young generation in history, has always done exactly the opposite of what your parents suggested that you do. 
And we know that when your teacher tells you something, as often as not, you're going to think, what do they know? All right? Nothing new about that. And with that reality in mind, you are sitting here now in an assembly, and you have to listen to a United States senator, and you're going to have to listen to the attorney general of the state, you're going to have to listen to a doctor, and you're going to have to listen to a former nurse. And no doubt many of you are thinking, why do I have to be here? There are other things I'd rather be doing. And so if some of you get bored and wish you were elsewhere, I understand that. But the reason that we are here today dealing with this very serious matter is that we need your help. Now, in the United States Senate, I sit on a committee. It's called the Health, Education, Labor, and Pension Committee. It is the committee that deals with all of health care issues and education issues. And we hear from some of the smartest and most knowledgeable people in the United States of America, and in fact, from all over the world. They come and they testify before our committee. But on this issue, opioid and heroin addiction, the issue of why so many young people are turning to drugs and how we can prevent that, it turns out that you probably know a lot more than the experts. You might know more than anyone else what it is like to have and live in a family where your mother or your father is hooked on drugs. And I expect that some of you here today are living that reality. You might know more than experts from Harvard or Yale what kind of pressure exists when your best friends are experimenting with pills and they want to know why you are not cool, why you are not doing what they are doing. What's the matter with you if you're not experimenting with pills? You might know how if perhaps you broke your leg skiing or you got some athletic injury or even if you had a molar, a tooth, extracted by your dentist, how kind of nice that feeling was after you took those painkillers. That was a nice feeling. Maybe I'll take more. And how tempting it might be to continue taking them. You might also know more than your teachers what it's like to be young in a very crazy world when you're dealing with anxiety or depression and you're watching the TV and you're seeing all kinds of weird things going on all over this world. You know that experience better than any of us here and better than your parents. So after this panel is finished, it will be your turn to tell us what you think about the problem and how we can best solve it. I need your help, not only for Vermont, but for the entire country. You can also ask any questions that you want, and the media will not be recording any of this. So you can say what's on your mind. There is no question that it's not a smart question. I don't care if anyone thinks it's a dumb question. If it's something that you feel, we want to hear your question and we want to hear your thoughts. And here is the main point that I want to make regarding opioids and heroin. You know, everybody goes through life, and every single day we all make mistakes. I make mistakes, you make mistakes. Sometimes we say something to somebody, we insult them, we hurt them, we don't mean to do it. Sometimes maybe we're an athlete, we screw up right here in this gym on the basketball court, my son played on the basketball team, you make a mistake, the team loses, you feel terrible. Sometimes you're hanging out with your friends, you're on the phone too much, you don't study for an exam, you fail your exam, and you feel like a jerk. Maybe you're a senior, you're not paying attention to what kind of college you might want to go to, 
or what kind of job you may want to get if you're not going to college. Everybody makes mistakes. But unlike those mistakes, getting involved in heroin, getting involved in opioids is a, is a mistake and a path that in many instances cannot be corrected or at best is very, very hard to correct. And let me be very clear. In many instances, getting hooked on opioids and heroin will literally take over your life. It will no longer be your life. And it will prevent you from living in any sense of the word a normal life. It will likely lead you, and the Attorney General will talk to this, into criminal activity because you'll suddenly need money to feed your habit. It will also, in some cases, lead to your death. In Vermont last year, 112,000 Vermonters died from drug overdoses alone, three times as many as died in 2010. Nationally, last year, we lost more than 60,000 Americans to drug overdoses. That is more people in one year than died in the Vietnam War. And what is especially tragic is that a significant percentage of the people who are getting addicted and dying are young people. And let me also be very clear. Drug addiction is hitting people from every walk of life. Doesn't matter if you're rich or you're poor, you're young or you're old, male or female, black or white, famous or not famous. It doesn't matter if you live in New York City or in rural Vermont, no one is immune. In a few minutes, Kelly Briere will tell you her story about how hard she has had to fight to overcome addiction, about how the father of her child died from an overdose, about what drugs have done to her and her family. And I hope you will listen closely to what Kelly has to say, because Kelly's story is the story of thousands of people in our state and millions of people all over the country. And let me also say that for Kelly and anyone else who is dealing or has dealt with addiction, this is not an easy thing to talk about. Nobody wants to get up in front of other people and talk about some of the major serious problems that you've had to overcome in your life. And too often, people are ashamed or they are embarrassed or they're trying to hide addiction issues because they feel the stigma of their experience. But Kelly hopes, and she can tell you this herself, that by talking about these issues, it will be easier for us to finally address them. And then I'm going to, talk, then I'm going to ask you to pay close attention to Dr. Heather Stein, who is a physician at the Community Health Center on Riverside Avenue. And what Dr. Stein does every single day is deal with people who are addicted. And what she is going to talk to you about is the physiology of addiction. What does it mean when you are addicted? Can you suddenly walk away and say, you know what, this is not good. I'm not going to do drugs anymore. Well, it ain't that easy. Because especially for young minds and young bodies, heroin and, opio and opioids have a huge addictive capability. They suck you in, and it is very, very hard to break that addiction. She'll also describe to you how there are drugs out there on the street right now that are so powerful, they will kill you almost instantly. And lastly, Attorney General T.J. Donovan, the highest ranking law enforcement official in our state, will talk about the relationship between drugs and crime, and how a very high percentage of people today in jail in Vermont and around this country are there because of some drug-related issue. And the Attorney General, like all of us up here, understands that addiction is a sickness and must be treated as a medical problem. Nonetheless, 
many, many lives have been destroyed and are being destroyed today. And let me conclude by saying that I know that some of you sitting here today have personal experiences on this issue. You might have a parent, an aunt or an uncle, a sister or brother, who has struggled with addiction. Some of you may even know someone who has died from an overdose, and some of you may have used drugs yourself. This is heavy stuff, not easy. And it might be hard to hear about it, and it might be hard to talk about it. But my hope is that the conversation today is helpful because if we do not have the courage to talk about this issue, if you think we can just hide it, we are never, never going to solve it. Last point is that the state of Vermont has been more aggressive and I think more effective than most states in trying to address this crisis. And today we have with us a number of agencies in the Chittenden County area who are all working on the problem. And after our meeting ends, please feel free to walk over to uh, these tables that are out front and get as much information as you can. Also, the state has a number that you can call 211 that directs callers to the help they may need. So you can get some information today. And with that, uh, let me now introduce to you uh, Kelly uh, Briere, who is going to share some very heavy-duty experiences that she has had in her life with you. Kelly? Wow. Um, so right up in front of a mic here with a huge crowd full of people that, um, that I'm really scared for. Um, when Senator Sanders' office contacted the Turning Point to find someone to speak about their experience, of course I jumped at the opportunity. Um, as he mentioned, I was a nurse, I was a professional in the community, in LPN. I worked in long-term care for 12 years. Um, when I was in high school, I was very aware of my family dynamic and system. Um, I thought that I was above, I, I was smart enough to know that if I experimented with drugs or with alcohol that I might be at risk because I saw other family members who were dealing with this. And um, when I was a senior in high school, I was a basketball player and I had an injury. I had an ACL tear and reconstruction and that was my first experience taking opiates. It was a very painful procedure. Um, I needed to be on pain medication for quite a while, and I was able to rehab from that. Um, but after having experience with addiction issues now, I know that that was the turning point for me. Um, I liked them a lot. They made me feel better. It wasn't just for the pain of my injury. And there was something in the back of my head that, that told me these make you feel better, these make you feel normal. Um, after high school, I went to college, went to VTC, graduated from the nursing program, and um, realized that I had chronic uh, pain issues. I have a condition called fibromyalgia, which my body and my nerves tell me I'm in pain when there's no injury. And over the years, being smart and being a nurse, I knew that if it got to that point where I, the physical therapy wasn't working, the chiropractic wasn't working, that I would take some pain medication you know, to get over that hump. I always took it as directed. I didn't abuse it, um, but this was a pattern over a couple of years. And after um, a series of tragedies and traumas in a very short period of time in my life, um, my mother was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer. I was pregnant with my first child. I lost my mother three months after I had my son, and uh, the relationship that I had with my son's father crumbled, and then I had an incident at work where I had a seizure and fell and fractured my skull, had a traumatic brain injury, and was in the hospital for a week. More pain medication came, and uh, much stronger pain medication. And going through all of these emotional traumas, having opiates at this time, 
Uh, I didn't even, as smart as I, I was, I didn't notice um, what the pain medication had started to mean to me. I was starting to use the pain medication when I didn't have pain to get through the day. I had an infant son and I was tired and I was recovering from this injury, yet I was still taking, I, I won't go into how much, but a fantastic amount of pain medication, which was called Dilaudid, which is a synthetic form of heroin. It is an opiate that the healthcare system uses um, that was derived from heroin that is used as a very strong analgesic for such injuries as the one that I had. Um, having gone through some, some counseling and realizing that this is the pattern that I had gone into, I actually went to my doctor myself the first time and said, look, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm taking this medication when I'm not having pain, I'm taking it when I, I have other things going on and to get through the day. And my doctor actually worked with me over a period of a month and a half to taper me off of this medication. And I thought I was doing okay. You know, I ratted myself out. I told my doctor I had a problem, right? This is, this is gonna resolve itself. And, you know, again, as, as educated as I was on this issue, I didn't know what switching substances meant. And a month later, after having never really used alcohol at all, even you know the occasional dinner with family or a glass of wine, I was drinking from dawn to dusk. And within a month, I was blackout drinking every day with my infant son by myself. Um, I had started a new relationship about four months after my injury, and. Um, this was my, my daughter's father, and he had a lifelong um, issue with alcohol and drugs, and we were very honest and open about that, and we both thought that we were doing okay. Uh, I hid my drinking from him. You know, the relationship was toxic from the start, and when I started having pain issues again after having gone to my doctor and told them that I had an issue with opiates, I wasn't prescribed anymore when I did have legitimate pain. So what I started doing was buying pills on the street when I needed them. I was self-medicating. I had returned to nursing at this point and I was working in local nursing homes and I started diverting medications from my patients. I was working eight hour shifts in a local nursing home and whatever I needed I was taking out of the medicine box and that was extremely easy. And I've only recently begun to admit that because the honesty of that act I hope will grab someone's attention. What happened in my family system, I was hiding the fact that I was diverting medication, we were still getting it off the street. This of course triggered um, the addiction issues that my daughter's father had and we were just in this pattern of toxicity thinking we were normal. We were a suburban family, I was working, he was working, and we were both addicted to opiates. When I ended up losing both of my jobs, I became pregnant with my daughter and still was using opiates while I was pregnant with my daughter. I was not honest with my OB. I had gestational diabetes, which will cause a fetus to grow very largely. I only gained 13 pounds during this pregnancy despite having gestational diabetes. Luckily, my daughter was born healthy, um, but at that moment, when she was born, she was born with withdrawal symptoms. And that was the first time that I actually admitted to someone when they confronted me with the fact that she had these symptoms, I, I told the pediatrician, yes, I had been using. However, somehow I was able to dupe DCF when they were called saying it wasn't an all the time issue. I was able to convince them that my household was safe, that my daughter wasn't at risk. I had visiting nurses coming into my house and was still able to convince these professionals that I was okay, when clearly I was 110 pounds after having a baby girl and just a mess. Fast forward a few years later, um, you know, pills 
just absolutely took over our lives when I first started realizing, hearing that voice in the back of my head saying, you know, your, your life is a mess, you're not paying your bills, you don't have money to get food for your children, you're about to lose your apartment, you can't pay rent. There was a little voice in the back of my head that said, well, maybe it's the bills. No, that, that's not the problem. We became homeless. I had an aunt that took us in uh, for a few months and I went back to drinking. We couldn't afford the pills and um, immediately started binge drinking again uh, with my children. My daughter's father was working at the time and we were, we were still trying to maintain. I was absolutely depressed um, and we ended up living <laughs> in a one bedroom apartment with a friend of his that I had just met with my two children, my son and my daughter, who had just turned one in the living room of this one bedroom apartment. And the, the friend was an alcoholic. Uh, less than a month later is when I first tried heroin. I was absolutely at my bottom. I was in so much emotional pain that it manifested more physically. I just, I could not get through the day. And I cannot stress enough or be honest more than to tell you the first time that I used heroin, that was it. It took over my mind more than the pills, more than the opiates. I already had that obsession going on from my addiction, telling my mind was telling me that's what I needed, that was the fix, that's what I wanted. The minute I tried heroin, that is all I could think about. I was working a 12-hour shift job at that point. I was able to maintain that for only a few months and that completely took over our lives. He started using, we started dealing to support our habit. There was an incident of assault with the person that we were staying with against me and we became homeless and went into the hotel room system that Vermont has for um, families who are homeless with children and or cold weather situations you might have seen on the news or um, have seen within the community that Vermont supports. And for four months, we used that system to bring dealers into Vermont with our infant daughter. My son's father had taken temporary custody of him, thank God, um, to keep him safe. And that is what we did. And that is the reality of what happened in our lives with addiction. We had dealers in our hotel room with our baby daughter to support our habit. I mean, there, there's no, there, <laughs> there's no sugarcoating that at all. You know, it, it got to the point where that was our lives and it was okay. And looking back on that, just, you know, man. So uh, we ended up having members of his family take us in at that point um, when the state would no longer put us up and they are in long-term recovery. His family unfortunately was riddled with this disease and had dealt with it and um, it came down to the point where we were in severe withdrawal one time and I convinced him to walk up the stairs with me hand in hand and they were the first people that I admitted that I had a problem to. And that was the beginning of our recovery. Um, that was the summer of 2013. I went to Act One Detox for a week, that's here in Burlington, and went up to Maple Leaf Farm for 25 days. And after graduating Maple Leaf Farm Rehab, I went to the Lund Center and was able to be safe with my daughter. And then he started going to rehab. And I was successful the first time I lived at Lund. I was there twice. Um, in and out in five months, you know, aced the program, eye on the prize, got an apartment, and he was still in and out of rehab struggling. He wasn't able to, to stick to sobriety for more than a couple of months at a time. And I really struggled, you know, with trying to be a single mom and trying to reconnect with my son who I had lost contact with. And it was just extremely difficult despite all of the support that I had. I had the Lund Center, I had a clinician, I had a family educator, and I had my little girl, and I was a single mom for the first time. And I didn't have my son. And I ended up um, having a relapse about eight months later. It was very brief, thank God, and with the support and the recovery and the 12-step programs I had been doing, um, luckily I was strong enough to call them up and say, hey, I, I need to come back, this, this isn't going, 
well, I've relapsed, I'm using again, I need some help, and they were able to get me back in within a month. Upon returning to the Lund home um, and really digging in that time, realizing how addiction had changed my thinking, the more work that I needed to do to get back to a healthy lifestyle, the way that I was still, despite all my work, obsessing that that was the answer constantly, um, I was able to really dig in and I used my clinician's help um, when my daughter's father was struggling, just back and forth, back and forth, and I stopped making excuses for him. And I think within a five month period of time, he had returned to rehab three or four times. And I was able to break away from that situation. He wasn't healthy and to keep my, my daughter and myself safe because if I had any contact with him, I know I would have started using again. So a year or so later, 11 months, I graduated the LUN program again, went back into the community, was still working with my clinician, and um, found out after an epic downward spiral of robbing convenience stores and you know pharmacies and this, that, and the other, that he was found in South Burlington in the woods by himself of an accidental overdose. And again, that reality and saying that out loud, just the impact that it has had, not only on my recovery, but my family and his family. This is the mess. When I met with Senator Sanders, I said, how messy do you want me to get? Because I, I can make it look real ugly. That's the ugly. My daughter doesn't have her father and I have to stay sober and I have to help her through that, and I have to be strong enough to get us through that in a healthy way, and it's because of the Lund Home, because of the sports that I have, and because of the Turning Point Recovery Center that I've been able to do that. I have been sober almost three years now, and a year past my daughter's father's passing of an overdose. I have no idea other than being able to ask for help and reaching out for sports that I have been able to do that, because I tell you what, my brain tells me regularly that that's the answer, despite all of the work that I've done. So we need to start telling the truth. I hope that something that I've said today has made sense to some of your situations, the things that you've seen, maybe not in your family or in your own family, but your friend's family, your peers, what they're struggling with. We need your help to find a solution. I can only share what my solution has been. We need to stop this now. We, I, I don't want any of you to have to feel the pain that my family has felt, that his family has felt, that my daughter and my son have felt. I urge you, if you have ever been asked to try an opiate, for whatever reason, even your doctor, please be careful. You have a choice now, and I've had a choice for three years because of what I've done. But after you have it in your system, you might not have a choice ever again. There's not much that one can say after hearing that story. But now I want to bring you uh, someone up here who deals with Kelly's issue every single day day as a physician here in Burlington. Please welcome Dr. Heather Stein. Hello. Hello. Uh, so my name is Heather Stein. I'm a family doctor, which means I get the chance to take care of people from birth to death and whole families. Uh, I'm originally from West Virginia, and then I moved up here to Vermont. And a lot of what I do in my regular practice now is screening people for and a lot of treating people for addiction, uh, mostly to narcotics and opioids now. Uh, I see many people in my clinic who've been touched by drug abuse and dependence. I suspect a lot of you have as well. Uh, I won't make you folks raise your hands, but I suspect many of you know someone personally who's lost a job lost their kids for a period of time, lost someone they love because of narcotics. Uh, over 250,000 kids a year 
use opioids for some reason other than pain. And there are a lot of different drugs that can make you feel different, but today we're talking about heroin, morphine, oxycodone, Vicodin, Percocet, fentanyl, hydrocodone, methadone, Dilaudid. Um, for some of those 250,000 kids, it's their first time. They're just trying it out, probably with friends or even family. Uh, for many others, they're using it to feel normal because their bodies are dependent on the drug now. I wish there was a way that I could do a blood test or an online quiz to predict which of you are going to be the ones who are going to struggle with addiction, right? Um, you might be the person who tries it once and says, ugh, I hate the way that makes me feel. I'm never going to do that again. But you might not. You might be the person who says, that felt better. I feel normal. I feel good for the first time in a while. And it would be great if we knew that beforehand, because that second person, the person who feels great or normal, they're the person who's really at risk to having their lives be completely taken over by these drugs. Um, I do know that the earlier you first use any substance that can be addictive, the more likely you are to become addicted to it. And you can say that's not fair, but I can say it's not fair that you know how to use your phone than I do, right, better than I do. A piece of new technology comes out and you're all over it and your parents and grandparents are looking at you like, how did you do that? <laughs> you could probably learn a new language twice as fast as me, right? So it kind of makes sense that your brain is going to become hooked on something that's really powerful faster than somebody who's twice your age, right? Uh, I treated a young man who was about 19 years old and he'd been using for several years. And during a relapse of heroin when he was still coming in to see me, he said, you know, I feel like the truest version of myself when I've got heroin in my system. But this is a small town. So I could walk downtown and I could see this young man and I saw what he looked like when he was using. And he didn't look like the best version of anything. He was unshowered, his eyes were red, he didn't recognize me, he was staring ahead with a glazed expression. He looked like he had no place to go and no resources in the world, even though I knew he was a wealthy college student from a good family. And you guys know, you know this from school, you know this from your personal experience, you know this from TV and the radio, that the worst thing that can happen is not looking terrible when you run into somebody downtown, right? It starts with being a little bit distracted because you're super focused on this one thing. Your friends and family might notice that you're not paying attention to the things that you normally care about. Maybe your grades start to slip. From the moment you wake up, your first thought is of getting opioids so you feel right. Instead of reaching for your phone first thing in the morning, you're reaching for a pill or a powder. You'll do things you can't imagine now to get narcotics, leaving you feeling ashamed and your family terrified. I suspect that if Kelly had been in this audience, if you had told yourself what you would end up doing later in life, you would have either laughed or gotten angry, certainly not believed that it was possible. If you aren't able to get what you need, you'll start feeling physically sick, right? Withdrawal. Just a little restless and irritable to start, but soon the sweating and the runny nose will kick in. Muscle aches, diarrhea. People will start asking you if you're feeling well or if you have the flu. And of course, there are other risks, right? Especially if you're snorting or using through a needle, you can get infections in your heart, the discs in your back, your blood, your skin, blood clots, hepatitis C, HIV. Even if you manage to get through the withdrawal for a few days, you'll realize it's not the same as before you started using. Because opioids cause changes in the brain that go beyond physical dependence. They rob you of your ability to feel joy if you do not take something that hits that opioid receptor. So that win, that A on a test, that hockey goal, getting somebody's phone number, instead of feeling a rush, you feel nothing. Opioids also take away the ability to deal with life. 
What do you need with coping skills when you have a narcotic? Anger, fear, insecurity, pain, they all go away when you have an opioid in your system. And your brain and your body forget how to manage those sensations. You go from being the toughest person you know, the person who can handle anything, the person who could get a tattoo and not even flinch, to somebody who cries at a paper cut or getting a shot. So I hope that most of you never know what I'm talking about today. I hope that none of you ever come to see me for help for this because you can't stop using. Of course, I'll help you if you do. It's a rewarding work to get people their lives back, um, but they are changed forever because of their history, and I hope that you all don't carry those scars. If you do, and don't be afraid to either get help for yourself or help your friends and family as well, I do see people who are able to turn it around like Kelly. Um, they often require therapy, medications, lots of office visits, and lots of time. But there is hope, and the sooner you get help, the easier it is. T.J. Jonathan is the Attorney General of the State of Vermont, the highest law enforcement official in the state. Mr. Attorney General. Thank you, Senator Sanders, and thank you for your leadership uh, on this issue. Um, the first thing I want everybody to know is this, that I, too, am a seahorse. <laughs> And the best days of my life were truly at this school. Uh, absolutely. And the, my best friends to this day are the guys I grew up with and the guys that I went to school here. Uh, and I saw Mr. Mazuzan earlier, and that and, uh, made me think of that. But listen to Kelly, and I want to thank you for your courage and talking about the truth, uh, <clears throat> I had a speech, I'm not gonna give it, because of what Kelly said. If there was a confused kid in high school who didn't have a clue about what they wanted to do or what they want, wanted to be in life, it was me. Um, I didn't have a clue. And I can remember in this building having enormous anxiety enormous anxiety about a lot of different stuff. One I remember in particular was, and he doesn't teach her anymore, but he's a great teacher, and I'll say this. Um, there was a lot of teachers at this school and in Burlington Public Schools who made a big difference in my life. Mr. Mazuzan being one of them. He was an art teacher, but was also a football coach, a freshman football coach. He used to say he actually taught football, and I think he did. Um, but Mr. M Mr. Mr. McGrath taught world history, ninth grade. And he used to have to read out loud in class. And I couldn't read, and I couldn't speak out loud, and I couldn't articulate a lot of the words, and I just remember that dread, that anxiety of the fear of having to read out loud. And so I compensated in different ways. Um, I wasn't a bad kid, but I, wasn't, I wouldn't say I was the best kid. Um, loved playing basketball on this court. Uh, loved hanging out with my buddies. And I made a lot of dumb mistakes with my friends. Drank too much, got arrested. Um, and I'll tell you what made the difference in my life. Who gave me a second chance. And that's not even true either. It's more like a third, fourth, fifth chance. It was the community. Was, was Burlington. And I'm really lucky that I grew up at a time that we didn't have the challenges you guys have. Nothing like heroin, nothing like opiates was even in the zone of possibility when I was growing up. And I was no better than anybody else. I just had a lot of different opportunities and a lot of different second chances. And that group of guys that I grew up with, um, we went on. And you, 
you guys are gonna find out as you go on through life, a lot of you are gonna take a lot of different twists and turns in life. And one guy in particular played football, uh, was the fullback on our team. Great kid, good looking kid, blonde hair, blue eyes, smart, charismatic. Um, we lost touch. Uh, but you know, I'll tell you this, the thing about growing up in Burlington, you're always going to be friends with the people you went to school with, the people you grew up with. If you don't talk to them for years, that's the way I was and am. If I see somebody talk to somebody who I grew up with, we don't have to say anything. We know it, that there's a bond. And this guy in particular, um, we lost touch. And then out of the blue, um, I got this random message from him on Facebook of all places. And I don't really Facebook. I don't even know if that's the term. Do you Facebook? I don't know. And it was a really random message and it was a desperate message. Uh, he was having trouble. Uh, and he asked me for help. And I could tell from the message that it was a message of desperation. And you know what I did? I didn't do anything. I thought like a lawyer. I didn't think like a regular person. Time went on. I remember seeing his dad uh, and kind of avoided the conversation. And then, I don't know whether it was weeks or months later, he OD'd, died. Heroin overdose. No different than me. And if you went back 25 years and we were sitting in this gym together, we'd, sit and, we'd be sitting side by side. Our group of guys would be sitting side by side. And you couldn't, man, you couldn't tell who was going to do what in life. You know, in my previous job, I was state's attorney here in, in Chittenden County. And one of the greatest privileges of that job was to be in a position of authority in the community which you grew up in. And you dealt with a lot of folks who you grew up with. You dealt with a lot of folks who you knew. And I always knew that they were good people. And I can think of a, a, another guy that I went to school with is a year, a year ahead of me. Got into drugs and, I mean, I think Kelly said this well. You can't judge about how this stuff starts. It starts and then all of a sudden it just takes off on you. And you don't recognize yourself. And the point about this guy was, I didn't recognize him. This addiction, uh, which is a disease, it, yes, it kills people, we know that for a fact, but it kills people's souls. And I remember seeing this kid, well, I call him a kid, he's my age, probably 40, older than, a year older than me, so he's probably 44. And he was just a shell of himself. And this, these feelings of shame, these feelings of embarrassment, that you're at, ostracized, that you don't feel part of the community. Uh, this takes a tremendous toll on people. It takes a tremendous toll on this community. And what we've done in the criminal justice system, uh, we've done a lot of good, as Senator, Senator Sanders has said, in this issue on the fight on opiates. We, we've, done a, we've done well. We need to do better. But what we haven't always done well is deal with the issue of addiction in the criminal justice system. I know a lot of people are good people who ended up in jail. And I mean, I think Kelly said this well. You start doing these extraordinarily dangerous things out of desperation. This is how powerful this addiction is. You're robbing, you're stealing. You're breaking into people's homes. And public safety is always going to come first. But one of the challenges I think we have in this fight, in reforming our criminal just justice system, is this. That when you come out of the criminal justice system, and you come out with that criminal record, this issue of being arrested, it's going to impact your ability to get a job. You're going to wear that scarlet letter on you. 
get a job, get an education, get housing. All the basic fundamentals that we all expect you, and I'm sure you expect of yourselves, to chase. It's really, really about the American dream, what we're talking about, and the loss of that American dream because of this disease. So, the other part I'm flashing back to was I can remember sitting in this gym, uh, listening to somebody trying to scare me, and I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to tell you the truth. Um, I think part of the answer going forward, and we have a good job, and I see my friend Mike Warren from the Burlington Police Department here, and I think Jay Lawson and other members of BPD. Um, we've really changed the way we do business in law enforcement when it comes to the issue of addiction. We've done a good job with enforcement, we've done a good job with intervention, we've done a good job with treatment. But what it comes down to is prevention. Uh, my thinking has evolved in that and has changed. And how do we create a community where we address these issues of trauma, where we address these issues of mental illness, where we address the issues of poverty, where we give people a safe place, where we wash away stigma for people who suffer from addiction, where we wash away for people stigma who frankly are in recovery, and continue to do what you guys are all doing here today and that I learned at Burlington High School, which is to take care of one of each other, to give each other a second chance, and to lift people up when they're down, and to speak out when we see somebody who's at risk. That made the difference in my life. You guys face a lot more challenges than I ever did, but I want you to know this. We, Senator Sanders said, we need your help, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you.